Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm a second year neurology resident at UCSF. Um, and today, I'm very excited to be talking over some neuropathology that's going to show up on USMLE Step 1, Step 2, as well as COMLEX Level 1, Level 2. And all of you who ever interact with any adults ever are going to see people with these conditions. So we'll go through them. Uh, first, before we get started, we'll briefly go over who we are at Med School Tutors. Um, I've been working for Med School Tutors for about four years now, I think. Um, predominantly in one-on-one -on -one tutoring, we all we work with people across the med ed continuum, pre-med all the way through residency, including for specialty board exams. Um, each tutor you work with sort of brings along the success of all the tutors before them. Uh, we share resources and ideas with each other about how to be better teachers and best support you all. Um, what we all share in common is that we really like to teach and hopefully that comes through tonight. Things that we'll cover today, um, I'm going to go over sort of the clinical presentation and management of neurodegenerative disorders. Um, hopefully focusing on tips and tricks to help you separate some of the nuances out in questions and make sure that you can really roll through these ones. We'll go over some radiology, I know that can be tricky for some people, and a few pathology images. Um, I've got lots of MRI slides in here as well. All of the images are from Radiopedia, um, unless I otherwise note. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more at the end about med school tutors and how we can be more helpful to you in the future. Um, and then I'll do a Q&A at the end, but I'll do my best to monitor the chat as we go. It's sometimes hard, um, let me pull it up. If you have questions or if I ask questions aloud and you wanna participate in the chat, I would really love that. So I just wanted to make sure we covered a couple neurophysiology things that are going to sort of creep their heads in and some of the things we talk about and maybe aren't otherwise taught and I don't think are well represented in some of board prep resources but can show up. The first of them is memory, right? And so sort of what is memory and where does it come from and how do we do it? Um, there's a couple structures that I just want to name. So the hippocampal formation, kind of the medial temporal lobe is what, what I want you to associate most tightly with memory. There's sort of surrounding areas of it, one of the words you might see that might be a little buzzwordy is the entorhinal cortex. And so those two kind of work together in order to facilitate both our short and long-term memory, as well as other types of memory that I won't go into. Um, I'll go, consolidation is basically how we take short-term memory, right? If I gave you a list of numbers to hold in your head and moved them into longer term, right? So things like a phone number that we memorize for a long period of time, rather than just numbers we can hold in our head randomly for a few moments. This uses a process that you might see called long-term potentiation. And so that basically every time you use it, it gets stronger. We have the opposite thing in our brain, places that we don't use gets weaker, right? Um, I don't think you'll ever be tested on the neurotransmitter. I've never seen it in a question, but you should know that glutamate is important for these things. You will be tested often on amnesia. And so I think it's important to separate when people have an interrograde amnesia so that's the ability to take any new thing, anything that I have in my short-term memory and integrate it into my long. And then retrograde amnesia, which is a little more uncommon, is the inability to recall events that happened before, right? So if someone has a traumatic brain injury and can't remember things that happened before that, I would think of that as a retrograde amnesia versus anterograde, if someone has a traumatic brain injury, you just met them, told them your name, five minutes later, they don't remember your name. The next thing that I'll quickly go over is just the limbic system. <clears throat> I think it's something that is often just named. We don't really know what it is or where it does. I want you to sort of think of it of just a bunch of things at the center of the brain. Don't worry as much about all the names. The hippocampus, like I mentioned, is part of it. And the amygdala is the other one I'll go over more specifically. <clears throat> I apologize. The function of it is sort of how we interact with the world, our behavior and our emotions, and especially those behaviors that help us survive. I like the home mnemonic, H-O-M-E, for homeostasis, olfaction, memory, which we've talked about, and emotions. The amygdala in particular does emotions like clear, pleasure, fear, anxiety, and then assigning emotional content to memories and situations. You'll see these affected in people who have limbic encephalitis, right? So I think people have heard of an NMDA receptor encephalitis, which is uncommonly tested on level one and step one exams, sometimes tested on later exams. Um, 
presentation can be with psychiatric disease, severe memory disturbance. I don't know if anyone's read the book Brain on Fire. It's an excellent book that a reporter had this condition and wrote about. Um, and then the other condition to note about the amygdala in particular is Kluver-Busey syndrome. So when patients damage their amygdala bilaterally, yeah, awesome, I see HSV, right? So that's a viral infection that tends to go after the temporal lobes pretty hard. So if it goes after both sides and I lose both amygdalae, then people will have sort of impulsivity, no fear, hyperorality, um, lots of kind of dangerous behavior and, and be relatively unaffected by it. One more slide about fizz, sleep, something again that I don't know that's always taught. People are, are curious about and they see all the squiggles and waves and don't know what to do with them. I wouldn't worry terribly about those. I'll just go over some of the anatomy that's important and maybe some disorders quickly. Um, think about your circadian rhythm as everything that your body does to help internally make sure that you have a 24 hour or slightly less than 24 hour sleep wake cycle. Um, you're awake when you need to be awake and asleep when you need to be asleep. Uh, the kind of the buzzwordy things that you should know about are, are orexin or hypocretin are the neurons that stimulate wakefulness. And I often think a lot about sort of brainstem as being something that's really helpful for wakefulness, the reticular activating system. To sleep, you should think about how we get sort of dark cues to, from our eyes back to some central parts of our brain. Think about the pineal gland and melatonin, right? And so melatonin becoming very popular over the counter for, for sleep aids. Biochemistry review, remember melatonin comes from serotonin, serotonin comes from tryptophan, that sort of plays into the Thanksgiving lore that turkey makes you tired, turkey's high in tryptophan, so the thoughts are that that makes why some of those foods make you sleepy. Uh, normal sleep should have stages, um, and then each cycle has multiple stages in it. You should go through a couple cycles of sleep. So you progress through non-REM sleep in sort of a dedicated phase, and then you have a period of REM sleep. As you go on, the amount of time you spend in REM sleep in each cycle goes up. So the first one, you might only be in REM for a few moments, three minutes, then later, then longer, then longer. Um, I like this phrase that a REM sleep period is an inactive body. You should be paralyzed, more or less, with an active mind. So with that in mind, when you think about something like sleep walking or REM behavior disorder, nightmares and sleep terrors, I think it becomes a little easier to sort out which one happens in which phase of sleep. And this actually comes up not uncommonly on things like the neurology shelf and the pediatric shelf. So something like a nightmare, which I imagine many of us have had, we typically remember the dream. We typically have an active mind, we typically have an inactive body versus a sleep terror where people will be not remember, we'll have, sort of have like this visceral, like sit up and scream and be terrified of what's happening. You can sort those out and whether or not they happen in REM, non-REM by thinking of the inactive body, active mind part of REM sleep. Okay, done with physiology stuff. Moving into sort of my, my personal clinical interest, which is dementia. Um, and before we get started with dementia, we'll go over delirium, which is a very commonly tested sort of associated condition. Delirium, for all of you in questions, is going to be a reversible confusional state. They're going to highlight that they fluctuate, right? Often you'll see things like sundowning, right? The confusion will get worse at night. Um, the profound symptom of delirium is a paired, impaired attention. Um, which often makes people think that there's a memory problem, right? So I, I will say sometimes to patients that um, if you told your sibling, cousin, niece, nephew, someone younger than you to do something while they were watching TV, they would be quite distracted and they wouldn't remember to do it later. It's not that they have a memory problem, it's that they have an attention problem at the time that you sort of ask them to put that information into their brain. Um, Think of delirium as a complication of illness or medications. Um, there's a huge list of medications that are most likely to cause delirium. Typically things that are sedating are gonna be more likely to cause delirium. It's more common in people who have kind of a poor substrate. You'll see some people talk about 
So underlying neurocognitive disorders, right? And I, I sort of think of that as, as the same way as I would think about an ankle, right? If you've previously fractured your ankle or torn a ligament in your ankle, and I put you through minor stress, you're more likely to have an injury to your ankle than someone who has no underlying ankle pathology. Um, treatment for delirium is non-pharmacologic first, always, right? So if you're ever in a next best step question, as long as the person is not posing a threat to themselves or anyone else, it is removal of the offending agent, right? Whether that be illness, sort of gentle reorientation, right? Keeping people's windows open during the day, helping them see and hear, all the things that sort of led to this confusion in the first place. If people are at, at risk, to hurting themselves or others, haloperidol is the agent of choice. Okay, now dementia, right? This is a word that I think all of us sort of have encountered outside of medical school, outside of residency, outside of wherever we are in our training process. Um, and it's often used incorrectly. So I wanna make sure that we have the right medical definition here. So I, it's a generic term, it's an umbrella term for disorders that affect cognition right, in any domain, we often think about it with memory, but it could be something like behavior, so severely that it impairs your daily function, right, so it sort of has to have that component that it has to impair daily function, and you can't better explain it by another medical or mental disorder, and it can't be something that's sort of always been there, right, so someone who's born with intellectual disability gets all the way late in life, has no change ever to their intellectual ability, I wouldn't call that dementia, right? So it sort of has to be a loss of some of these things that we used to be able to do. Um, <clears throat> with exceptions that I'll go over, you should think about dementia as something that is gradual, right? Over years, someone was functional and became non-functional slowly over a long, long period, right? So if someone was normal before they went into the hospital and then became impaired while in the hospital, dementia is not your answer. You should think about things like delirium. The single greatest risk factor for dementia is age. But I wanna be very clear, because I also think this is something that you might have to educate some family members and friends about sometimes, that dementia is not a normal feature of aging. There are, nor there are normal memory changes, language changes that happen with aging, but dementia, right? Those changes that make it so significant that you can't live your life is not a normal part of having more birthdays. Uh, Mohammed, is this different from delirium tremens? Yes. So delirium tremens um, is the word we use sort of in that later period in alcohol withdrawal, like that 48 to set, and that's characterized by hallucinations, increased risk for seizures. Um, good thought, different type of delirium. Okay. Within, I mentioned the umbrella of dementia, the most common and the one that we typically think about is Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease, you should look in your vignette for your person to be about 70, I would say to 90 years old. Um, the average sort of age I, I mentioned here, it typically takes about eight to 10 years for someone to be from diagnosis to death for Alzheimer's. So it's a, it's a relatively slow disorder. Um, the predominant symptom, the predominant cognitive domain that's affected is memory. And I think we all know that. You can later have abnormalities in visual spatial abilities and behavior, right? I think many of us who've rotated in the hospital have seen sort of behavioral disturbances in patients who have relatively end-stage Alzheimer's disease. As before, age is the most important risk factor, but there are genetic things that we should think about. So many of you will hear, right, about the APOE4 gene. The more copies of that you have, the more likely you are to have dementia, but it is not going to cause dementia in everyone, right? So if I have someone who has no APOE4 copies versus someone who has one copy, the person who has one copy is about three times more likely than baseline to have dementia. A person who has two copies is about 15 times more likely than baseline to have dementia but it itself is not pathologic. These other disorders, however, right, so these genes that I list, APP, presenilin-1, and presenilin-2, typically dispose people to early onset familial Alzheimer's, right, diagnosis in 50s and 60s, sort of multiple family members with early onset. And I would think of that more of like a genetic inheritance pattern. 
Unfortunately, there are no disease modifying treatments for dementia. I, there, there's recently been some controversy about the FDA approval. That's not the, the topic of, of today's talk. There are still no efficacious disease modifying treatments for Alzheimer's disease. You can slow the decline typically right, by only a few months um, with cholinesterase inhibitors. And there are three, and I will give people an opportunity in the chat to name some of them. Denepazil, awesome. Sort of the most commonly prescribed one. And then the other two are so hard to remember and you're like, people always use denepazil anyway. Galantamine, awesome. I have never used pezulostigmine, but maybe it is. Rivastigmine, absolutely. Yeah, denepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine are sort of the three that I would expect to see on tests. You can also use memantine, which is an NDA receptor antagonist. Um, my next question that I have at the bottom of the slide is which chromosomal abnormality is associated with a significant increase in Alzheimer's disease? Some data would suggest 80% of people who have this. Yeah, downs, right? So that APP gene is carried on chromosome 21. And so it's the amyloid precursor protein. And so we'll get into the pathology of Alzheimer's, but one of the pathologic features is amyloid plaques. And so people who do not have Downs have two copies of the APP gene, have two copies normally of that amount of amyloid. People who live with Down syndrome have that third chromosome 21, that extra dose of amyloid. It's near 80% of people with Down syndrome who live to 50 years old by some studies, some studies say 60% uh, will eventually develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, I mentioned PATH. Uh, there's lots of little things that you can see in the pathology. Um, there are the extracellular amyloid plaques and the intracellular neurofibrillary tangles. And so what I want you to think of is the plaques are sort of sheets that are made from like woven together amyloid that's just depositing all over the brain. And it itself is not necessarily correlated with disease severity or disease progression. And then there are these tangles which are made of tau, which is another pathologic protein. Um, and those in particular do tend to correlate with disease severity. So the imaging that you'll see for the, uh, you'll see some pathology imaging for those. It's, it's, they're, they're kind of best typified. The first aid book has some good, some good pictures there. Um, in terms of imaging, hard to make a diagnosis purely at imaging. Imaging tends to support a diagnosis. Typically the brain is globally shrunken most pronounced in the temporal lobes, and then sometimes can be more pronounced in the kind of the parietal lobes. So this person, I think if everyone took their hand um, and sort of covered the top half, right? So from here up, they might say that, yeah, back here is pretty full. And if they covered this bottom half and looked up here, you might say, yeah, those temporal lobes are a little more atrophied than somewhere else. So this would be a selective atrophy pattern. Okay, so these are for my step two people. This is how I always, always, always teach people. This is the example that I use. Always read the last line very carefully, right? So if I give you a story, a classic story for someone with Alzheimer's, a 75 year old person is brought into the clinic by their daughter because they got lost driving in their neighborhood. They've been more forgetful. They leave objects in other rooms. They sometimes don't recognize people's faces. And if I say to you, what is the next best step in diagnosis? That is a very different question than what is the gold standard of diagnosis? So what would be the next best step in diagnosis for someone who you suspect to have Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, Kevin, awesome. I think I, Harmon, I, I totally agree with you, right? So I kind of want all of these things, right? But so the the golden rule sort of for, for step two and level two is that you want to do the least invasive thing first, right? So you want to do a, a formal neuropsychiatric assessment, right? Or formal neurocognitive testing, right? So a mini mental, a MOCA, actual dedicated, you know what I mean, testing. Um, there's labs and MRI and other things that you should do while you're thinking about this person, but that's typically the next best step. What if I said the gold standard? It's a gold standard. Autopsy. Yeah, Kim. And so I think that anyone would look at you probably rightfully with a lot of confusion if that was your recommendation on sort of the next best diagnostic step. So be really careful about exactly what the question asks you. All right. So the next most common cause of dementia, right? Cabrella term, next most common is going to be vascular dementia. 
So the symptoms are going to sort of blend together with Alzheimer's, right? The patients are going to have some memory impairment, right? Maybe some functional impairment, could have incontinence, could have lots of different things. But rather than it being caused by these amyloid sheets and these hyperphosphorylated tau tangles, it's due to just sort of chronic reduced blood flow microvascular disease to the brain. The sort of classic description is that it's stepwise, um, that as you accumulate sort of stroke burden with time, that you're going to gain more and more impairment. Risk factors for these are going to be the same vascular risk factors that you see with everything, right? So smoking, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. Um, the imaging is not specific. The treatment is to fix all of the things that's causing it. Uh, ignore that next part. And I'm going to go on to this. So additional vignette tips for me that I think are helpful in delineating that the person has vascular dementia. They're typically going to describe their neurologic exam a little bit more than they do with patients who have Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. They might like hint that they have some hyperreflexia in one limb, right? They're going to give you something that might suggest that there's an old stroke in there or there's a little bit of weakness. Um, they almost always will give you an exact time, right? So someone with Alzheimer's will accumulate, right? They might be at the start only having trouble with this thing and then this thing and this thing, but the question writers won't tend to give you exact time points. In vascular dementia, they tend to give you exact time points. Like eight months ago, was able to do this. Maybe a month ago, wasn't really able to do this. They sort of will use the numbers more often. And then almost always in that sort of first line, they'll or second line, they'll emphasize some sort of non-neurologic history that suggests risk, right? So I tend, they'll, they'll mention that the person had a coronary artery bypass or that they have diabetes. And then they'll give you that they're on like multiple medications, right? So they're on insulin and they're on, glipizide, they're on multiple, whatever they may give you, rather than sort of just mentioning that they have a history. So they'll sort of really sell that non-neurologic. That's just the personal experience things. Um, this MRI is a little hard, right? So this person has probably, they have big ventricles, but you can see these white matter changes, right? So right around the ventricles, whenever you see white matter disease, that's kind of where they show up. Okay. Why is the ventricle bigger? I don't know. Could be, I, I would tell you there's a couple of reasons, right? This person looks like they have atrophy all over and the ventricles could look big for that reason. There could be another reason why, but I, this was the best picture I could find uh, under Creative Commons license for white matter disease. Frontotemporal dementia. So these are, this is actually another sort of category of disorders. I think the way it's taught typically is you'll only learn one. You, you will kind of call it PIC disease. That's not necessarily true. There's a bunch of different types. PIC disease is sort of one specific name for one specific type, but you can think of them all more or less the same for your purposes. So it's the most common cause of dementia in those younger than 60. So it's kind of the most common young, and, and that's the age range that you should think about it, right? So I would think about it in 50, 60 year old. Earlier, I mentioned that dementia is not always memory, right? So these are changes in behavior sometimes language, sometimes movement, very often can just be behavior. These people can perform perfectly on memory testing. Um, pathologically, similar hyperphosphorylated tau, right? You're going to hear about tau. Tau kind of causes a bunch of different disorders. Um, those inclusions are called pick bodies in, again, certain types of disease. And then you'll also hear about this ubiquinated TDP43. There are other pathologic features. Um, I would know these two. And then to the imaging that I have on the right, I'll kind of tell you a little bit more about this imaging. This is a T2 MRI. Um, and you can tell because the CSF is very bright. And you can see that there's more CSF up here at the front of the brain in the frontal and temporal lobes than there is here at the back of the brain, right? So you kind of have a very, this really highlights the significant atrophy pattern. This person also has big ventricles, more so in the front than in the back. Basel, yes, we can see tau in Alzheimer's, we can see tau in PIC disease, we can see tau in some Parkinsonism syndrome, syndromes, we can see tau in a lot of different places. But for testing, don't let me mess you up, right? You, I would think about tau as Alzheimer's frontotemporal dementia. All right, the next sort of category of dementia, I think hopefully all of you are understanding that maybe there's just a little more to dementia than just, oh, that person doesn't, that person has dementia, right? There's a little more science to it. Um, is the Lewy body dementias. And so these are, these are dementias that are, are typified by having movement disorders. And I would say what I would sort of hope that you can take away is well-formed visual hallucinations. 
And when I say well-formed, it's actually kind of characteristic for these people to, vis- to have hallucinations of animals and small children. That's sort of the, like if I hear someone say, oh, my family member hallucinates children in my house, my like alarm bells for this diagnosis go off. Um, they can have cognitive impairment, right? So memory, it can also sometimes be described as fluctuating, right? So people will say, oh, they have a good day and they have a bad day, right? And that, that's kind of common for this. Note that it's always there and it's always progressing because I also mentioned that delirium can be fluctuating, right? But delirium is sort of reversible and fluctuating and, and not with all of these other things, this is, this is sort of more chronic and having kind of fluctuations with time. Pathologically, right, these are all typified by having Lewy bodies, which we'll talk about later because we're going to talk about Parkinson's, which are intranuclear, and I have a picture later, aggregates of alpha synuclein. So just unfortunately, words that probably don't mean a lot and are hard to connect meaning to, um, but important pathology. So I may have, have a little umbrella here. Um, there's two different things. This is more important for step two and level two. Um, dementia with Lewy bodies is when you have these motor symptoms of Parkinsonism and cognitive symptoms that happen within a year of each other, right? So someone comes to clinic and says, you know, I mean, my parent for three months has had this tremor and for five months has been getting lost, hallucinating, that that would be concerning for dementia with Lewy bodies. Parkinson's disease itself, which again, we'll talk about, can have motor symptoms for a very long time and carries an increased risk of dementia. If the cognitive symptoms are a year later than when the motor symptoms started, the diagnosis is Parkinson's disease dementia. Both have Lewy bodies, both have the same pathology, it's just how we name them. All right, you'll read this a lot. Um, I, I don't tend to use this word. Pseudodementia is not really a scientific word, but it's the word we use to describe when people have cognitive impairment from untreated depression. Um, the analogy that I give, I, I talked about earlier, like if you asked a, a younger kid to do something while they're watching TV, their mind is full of TV. There's no room for that task to get in. Someone who has a mood disorder and their mind is swirling for any number of reasons, sort of the same thing, right? It's harder for that information to encode and get in. I use this rule of thumb in questions, but not my clinical practice. Sometimes things that make you good quest- test question takers don't make you a good doctor. Just remember that moving forward. If the patient is the one coming in the clinic and saying that they have memory problems, could probably be depression. That's the easiest, you know what I mean? That's sort of how they're, they're recognizing that their attention is poor. If the family member brings the patient into clinic with memory complaints and the patient's like, no, I'm fine, I do all that perfectly, that's more likely to be a question about dementia. So patients with dementia tend to minimize their symptoms or not recognize that they can't do those things. Um, there are other things that can look like dementia, right? So hypothyroidism, B12 deficiency, and syphilis are things that you should rule out before you diagnose someone with dementia. Uh, really brief, I mentioned earlier that dementia should go so slow. Um, there are rapidly progressive dementias. These people go from totally well to full-blown dementia, typically in a period of weeks to months, and often almost always die within a few years. Um, the one you need to know about is CJD, Critzfeld jakobs disease, which is a prion disorder, right? So think of, I mean, that is a misfolded protein that can infect other cells is sort of how I would think about it. It almost always is sporadic, meaning that it just happens. I think we all I've heard stories or I don't know, my, I had someone in my anatomy lab in med school who didn't want to dissect the brain because they didn't want to get prion disease. Corneal transplants, like acquired prion disease is extraordinarily rare. And then sometimes this can be familial, but you don't have to worry about that. Typically causes like, again, just all of the dementia symptoms that you can think of fast. Um, the sort of ones that you might look for to help you pick this one out the startle myoclonus, they'll mention that when the door is open or someone claps that there's jerks in the patient. So myoclonus is a brief increase in tone. A hiccup is myoclonus. So think of that in muscles in the body. Um, this disorder is universally fatal. The MRI has suggested features that we're not going to go through, but just so you know, they're there. Um, you do have to know that the EEG can show periodic sharp waves. I don't know why they expect you to memorize EEG details, but that's what they are. And then CSF uh, 1433 protein is the one that's most commonly tested. In real life, that's sort of nonspecific. 
I, I think sometimes I've seen in questions they can ask them, but the RT quick is the one that's more specific for CJD. But anyway. Okay, that was dementia. There's a couple of other things that I'll, I'll sort of tie in as we go, but I'll how am I doing on time? Pretty good. Now we'll talk briefly about Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease. Oh, okay. So this is an MRI of the basal ganglia that's not going to play for me. This is just a normal MRI of the brain. This is a T1 MRI of the brain that I will pause. I will go right there. Right, so always I always look at the lateral ventricles. Right next to the lateral ventricles is the caudate. This is the third ventricle here. Next to the third ventricle is the thalamus. And then sort of this is the internal capsule, white matter tract. And then out here are things like the globus pallidus and the um, putamen. So these sort of all classify the basal ganglia. You'll hear me talk about it being subcortical, right below the cortex, deep in the brain. And um, some people will refer to this as the deep gray matter, right? So you can see that this is all the white matter in the brain. This is the deep gray. Apologies, I did not realize it was going to take me out of. Great. I did this quickly in another webinar. I will um, go through it. This is memorizing the basal ganglia is not important. Um, I, people will agonize doing it for exams. This is my shortcut. Um, sorry, Kim, couldn't see the moving mouse if I was pointing. Uh, hopefully the description was enough. Um, the, for the basal ganglia, there's that picture that's hard to memorize. I always lay it out like this. I put the thalamus stuff over here, thalamus and subthalamic nucleus, put everything else on a line that's sort of from outside in, striatum, GP, GPI. Anything that comes from the thalamus is stimulatory up and to the left. The direct pathway, anything from the cortex, right? The brain tells people what to do is stimulatory all the time. The direct pathway is fast. So it goes straight from the striatum to the GPI, GPI to thalamus. Negative times negative is positive. So the direct pathway makes people move. The indirect pathway takes a stop. It's indirect. Negative times negative times negative. Three negatives is negative. So the indirect pathway stops you from moving. Don't worry about memorizing it. I just like that trick. I often will draw in the substantia nigra over here, substantia nigra pars compacta. All it does is send dopamine I should, onto the striatum. And when that dopamine binds to D1 receptors on the direct pathway, D1 as a G protein is stimulatory. So it just makes it go. Or if it sends it through the indirect pathway onto D2 receptors, which use GI, dental cyclase. So those are inhibitory. So that puts another negative in the picture. So negative, 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 negative. That's four. And that's pro-movement. Don't let me confuse you. Hopefully, if that if that's stuck, if not, just remember direct pathway makes people move. Indirect pathway sort of suppresses movements. And the substantia nigra helps both of those be pro-movement. So now you will see why we're getting into Parkinson's disease. Um, so clinically, Parkinson's disease has four cardinal features, tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural instability, OK? So the tremor is typically described as a pill rolling tremor, right? You'll see in people's hands, it is a tremor. There we go, I have it now, right? And often you'll see people's thumbs move. It tends to be asymmetric. So people tend to have it in one hand worse than the other, but they can have both. It often, um, it's resting, right? And you'll, I often see people who have Parkinson's sort of hold, right? You can, they can make it go away. They can suppress it. Um, Rigidity is when you try and move, there's too much tone, right? So you can feel like it's not easy to move someone, sometimes described as cog wheel rigidity. So basically what that, what that is, is when you're moving their arm, there's actually a little bit of tremor in their arm. So you feel like it sort of clicks like the gears on a wheel. Bradykinesia is slowness of movement, um, which you can see in a whole bunch of different ways in Parkinson's. And then postural instability, uh, tendency to fall, 
cogwheeling with both extension and flexion. Yeah, so this is this is often right. So I would say that if you're ever on a neuro rotation and you need to like just say to someone like, oh, the person was hard to move, right? Just say that they've increased tone. It's actually really hard to describe whether or not someone has spasticity, which I think Auburn, you're you're maybe referencing sort of there's a difference in what the tone looks like, whether whether or not I'm flexing the limb or extending the limb versus rigidity which is sort of an overall difficulty, right? With Parkinson's, I tend to move people's wrists around. It doesn't really matter which direction I'm going. Um, so to answer your question, not really, but yes. So just say increased tone. People will know what you mean. Um, onset is typically after 60. There's other features, right? These aren't the features that you can make diagnoses off, but shuffling gait, right? So people will sort of be stooped over. Their feet will not really clear the floor and they'll sort of shuffle along. Masked facies, so decreased facial expression. Um, so typically the top half of the face doesn't move as much, less smiling. Um, patients won't blink, right? So part of that slowness is, is fewer blinking episodes per minute. Constipation, again, I think of that slowness like the bowels and then depression is super common in Parkinson's as well. COVID complicates things, but anosmia used to be a, a pretty helpful prodromal feature. So people who would lose their sense of smell, sometimes a warning that Parkinson's disease was on, in their future. Um, okay, path for this, we sort of talked about it earlier, but you lose dopamine producing neurons in the substantia nigra, which is in the midbrain. I have a picture on the next slide. They have Lewy bodies, right? So these intranuclear eosinophilic inclusions of alpha synuclein, which we mentioned. I've never seen this in real life. It's something you might be tested on, but I don't know what this stands for, but MTPT, MPTP, it's a toxin that sometimes some drugs are cut with. And so can cause Parkinsonism. There's tons of things that can cause Parkinsonism. I just wanted to have this one on here. Um, treatment is its own entire talk. I can, I'm happy to sort of take more time at the end if we have to go over some Parkinson's meds. Um, putting dopamine back into this person's body is, is, is the way to treat their Parkinson's. You can't give them dopamine directly because I think we also use dopamine as like a presser for people. We use dopamine for other reasons. Um, it makes people crazy nauseous if you just give them dopamine. It's hard to get it to cross the blood-brain barrier. So there's a lot of reasons we don't use dopamine. We use levodopa, which is a pro drug of dopamine. And then we give it with carbidopa, which prevents that levodopa from being turned into dopamine in our body, right? So I mentioned that like things like nausea and sort of the peripheral actions. I don't want that. I want all of that pro drug to make it up to the brain and then be used. So carbidopa is a peripheral. Um, it prevents the conversion of levodopa into dopamine. So that's kind of the, the mainstay of treatment. If you're gonna remember one Parkinson's drug, remember that one. Uh, Harmon, meperidine is an opioid that I don't tend to think of as a Parkinson's treatment, but all of these drugs totally mixed together. Um, there's other ones, the dopamine agonists, they direct, they act directly on the dopamine receptor, uh, bromocryptine, cabergoline, and pramipexol are the ones that you, you know, you should know about, um, just by name, really. If you remember from some of your sort of preclinical psych lectures, increased dopamine can, is in the reward pathway. So actually these medicines in particular can cause gambling disorders and addictions. Um, so we don't tend to use them as much. We watch for them because too much dopamine can just cause a very impulsive sort of addicting reward behavior. MAOI, MAOIB inhibitors, so selegiline and resagiline um, are selective to help and keep more dopamine available in the brain. Same with the COMT inhibitors, um, enticapone and tolcapone. Those also help keep more dopamine just available. You also see the drugs trihexyphenidyl and benztropine. Those are anticholinergic drugs. There's a, there's a theory that when you lose dopamine and there's too much acetylcholine left in the brain, that that imbalance is what leads to some tremor symptoms. So for younger people who are tremor predominant, we use those meds. You don't have to know that. You just have to know that those drugs are sometimes used. Great. Quick pictures, pathology, right? So these are the Lewy bodies. This is sort of the eosinophilic intranuclear inclusion. Um, this is a Congo red stain. I'm by no means a neuropathologist. Very little extra to offer you in terms of pearls on neuropathology.
Um, this is my nice drawing of the midbrain. The substantia nigra sort of lives right here. It's typically pigmented, right? Nigra meaning black. And so as people develop Parkinson's disease, it sort of goes away. So if you ever see a, a cross section of the midbrain that looks like this, and there's not a black stripe in this location, then they're trying to suggest Parkinson's disease to you. Um, quickly going through this, uh, the Parkinson's disease treatment versus schizophrenia, and then sort of, I know someone meant, like we were talking about things that can cause Parkinsonism, right? So if someone has schizophrenia and is on dopamine depleting drugs for a long period of time, after a while, they can look like they have Parkinson's. They do not have Parkinson's disease. They have Parkinsonism from their antipsychotic medications. So if I go through this, right, just you do have to know these, unfortunately, the four places of, of dopamine pathways in the brain. So mesolimbic, mesocortical, we talked about the limbic system, right? Emotions, sort of uh, really vivid sort of ways of interacting with the world. In schizophrenia, I have way too much dopamine in the mesolimbic pathway, right? So those are my positive symptoms of schizophrenia. I tend to have less dopamine in the mesocortical so sort of the areas that require dopamine of my cortex, my thinking. So those kind of a, affect the negative symptoms of my schizophrenia. Nigrostriatal is from the substantia nigra to the striatum or the basal ganglia. So that's not really affected in schizophrenia on the right, but is affected in Parkinson's. That's sort of the primary issue. And then tuberoinfundibular is the dopamine to the pituitary, which I think we maybe have you know, learned in some of the side effects, right? So what is, if someone would put in the chat, what is dopamine's effect on the pituitary gland? Inhibit prolactin, awesome. Yeah. So a couple of the clinical correlates of that um, that we'll go through here and then I'll, I'll maybe add one more. So if I treat Parkinson's disease, right, I give someone too much dopamine. I kind of worry about giving them visual hallucinations, right, sort of making them look like they have the hallucinations of schizophrenia. I can help their thinking a little bit. I don't really think of that. And my goal is sort of to make this neutral, right? I want sort of just normal movements at the nigrostriatal pathway. I don't really think of any symptoms of too much inhibition of prolactin here. Right, so that chart becomes kind of simple. If I go over to the schizophrenia chart, which is really not the content of today's talk, but I think really helpful to go through in this context, if I block dopamine, I tend to really improve the symptoms of hallucinations. Absolutely. It doesn't really help me at all with some of the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, which is typical, right? So those are the hardest to treat. It can, induce a Parkinsonism, right? So the same pathology. And then if we lower dopamine, that means we raise prolactin and we can get things like galacteria, right? So that can be some of the side effects that we see there. The other clinical correlate to this pathway, right? If you have someone who has a pituitary adenoma that produce, produces prolactin, you treat them with dopamine drugs, right? carbergoline, bromocryptine, pramipexol, direct dopamine agonist, the same ones we use for Parkinson's to inhibit the prolactin production from their tumor. Great. Please gloss over this. Just, I'm just gonna say the words so you've heard them. Um, there are atypical Parkinson syndromes. Sometimes they're called Parkinson's plus syndromes. Um, depending on who you talk to. These rarely show up in some of the second level board exams, but they're worth talking about. So dementia with Lewy bodies is gonna show up, right? So that's typically viewed as an atypical Parkinson syndrome. You have the symptoms of Parkinsonism, right? Rigidity, tremor, but you also have the, like we talked about, profound visual hallucinations, cognitive symptoms, fluctuating. There's also multiple systems atrophy which I want you to think about kind of looks like Parkinson's, but has really early severe autonomic failure. They have horrible orthostatic hypotension, urinary symptoms, bowel symptoms, tons of falls because their, orthos their orthostasis is so profound. It's all you should think about with it. There's tons about it, but you'll see that on step two and level two, just as an answer choice. 
progressive supranuclear palsy uh, is limitations in eye movements along with some of the other Parkinson's stuff. And then the one that you're gonna see the least is corticobasal syndrome, sometimes referred to as corticobasal degeneration. They sort of have more arm stuff, but the one that I think is interesting is they have alien limb phenomenon. So they'll often say that their arms do things that they don't want them to do, or their legs do things that they don't want them to do, sort of that someone else is controlling their limbs. But that one I don't expect you to see, but it's, it's on the list. You will see dementia with Lewy bodies on test. You might see MSA and PSP on test. You probably won't see CBS on test. I can answer more questions about them, but recognizing that it's very niche. A couple miscellaneous things to go through. I just have a few more slides and then we'll take questions. Um, Huntington's disease, a neurodegenerative disorder. I think we've, we've all heard of this. So um, similar to the other ones, sort of has a bunch of different manifestations. They tend to happen in this order. They tend to be behavioral, then cognitive, then motor. I think we often think about motor symptoms of Huntington's, um, but they sort of cause behavioral disturbance first. The onset is in the 20s to 50s. Um, remember, there's, there's some genetic components to this. What is sort of the genetic principle that if a family of, let's say the, the dad has Huntington's that's diagnosed in, at 45, then I would expect the child, yeah, anticipation, very good. Yeah, so each generation that the genes are passed on, the disease tends to affect people earlier. And that's because the trinucleotide repeats tend to expand um, with mitosis. And I believe it's more common with paternal transmission than maternal transmission to have worsening anticipation just because of the frequency at which the reproductive, whatever, with sperm, I, again, this is not, that's a little farther outside, but what you need to remember is anticipation. Um, and then again, I think it's worse with paternal transmission. That's just a, a fact. Other fun fact, Huntington's disease was initially described by a medical student um, who just observed sort of this catastrophic decline in some of his patients and later it was named after him. He was like right about most things. Pathology, I mentioned the trinucleotide repeat. You have to know this is CAG. And the Huntington gene on chromosome four uh, tends to sort of destroy a particular part of the brain, the caudate and the putamen first, and then later we'll sort of go after the rest of the brain. Um, there's unfortunately no disease modifying treatment, right? There's nothing that stops or prevents this. We use dopamine depleting therapy. Um, so the VMAT inhibitor that we use is tetrabenazine. Uh, you'll see reserpine in books. We don't use it anymore, but also there. And then sometimes antipsychotics to control symptoms, but that has nothing, you know what I mean? It's not treating anything. It's controlling some of the really profound psychotic symptoms that can be present in Huntington's. My question at the bottom, what other condition can present with chorea, which I didn't even define for you on USMLE exams. Chorea means dancing, right? So chorea form movements are typically, patient will be doing something, right? And they'll have a chorea form movement and they'll just kind of move it into some other part of their body. You'll sometimes see this referred to as chorea-athetosis. Athetoid movements tend to be smaller. They're sort of described as snake-like. Chorea is sort of a bigger dancing movement. Athetosis is sort of smaller. Sometimes it's hard to tell which is which, so people will say chorea-athetoid movements. Yeah, sometimes chorea, awesome. For rheumatic heart disease, excellent. Yeah, I mean, Kevin, love it. So it's part of the Jones criteria. That's the S of the Jones criteria for rheumatic heart disease. Tends to happen a little bit after, but good. Wilson's, not something that people always think about with neuro, right? We sort of learn really heavily like the liver stuff and the Kaiser Fleischer rings in the eyes. Um, the other name for this is hepatolentiform degeneration and lentiform is sort of the word we use to describe the putamen and the globus pallidus. So this causes just damage to the basal ganglia. So these people get movement disorders, either too much movement, hyper or too little movement like Parkinson's, psychiatric disease, <clears throat> and then we know liver and then often renal too. Almost always before 40, the question will always give you, either they present with psychiatric syndromes and they'll tell you that a family member died of cirrhosis without drinking or something like that, or the other way around, the person will have liver and they'll, they'll mention sort of a strong positive family history for psychiatric disturbance at a young age. Pathologically, it's this mutation in the copper, in the hepatic copper transporter, 
Um, that is erroneous. It is not the cardiac putamen. It is the basal ganglia, but it's not atrophied. It's deposition. Uh, labs, the serum cereal plasmin is the one that we typically send when we suspect this, and then copper chelation. I'll quickly touch on HIV AIDS as it relates to dementia. Um, you'll hear AIDS dementia, it's in sort of some board prep resources. In real life, we typically call this HIV associated neurocognitive disorder or HAND or HAD, but HAND is, is more typical. And it's just a, again, there's, you're more likely to have dementia when you live with HIV or AIDS. And so it's sort of a diagnosis of exclusion after other. There's some selective pathologic findings, but nothing, again, just mentioning it as it is, a, is a something that you might see. HIV and AIDS can also cause sort of what looks like a rapidly progressive dementia with a progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And so again, what you need to know about this is a reactivation of a virus that lives in many of us, right? So most, some, a lot of people are JC virus positive. They tend to take a, a medicine that suppresses their immune system. That virus can then grow and cause progressive, multivocal, all over, leukoencephalopathy, right? So leuco meaning white, encephalo meaning brain, apathy meaning disease of, right? So disease of the white matter of the brain. Um, they get very sick, very fast, alter mental status, and the MRI is going to show that their white matter everywhere is, is affected. There, again, there's more, but that's sort of, if you had to take two lines away, that's what I would take. Versus primary CNS lymphoma, which is another sort of declining disorder that can be associated with HIV and AIDS. These people typically, the question will be about headache with a focal neurologic deficit, or they'll just show you the imaging. They won't make you pick it out clinically because it's a little harder. Um, this one is associated with EBV infections and the MRI is gonna show a ring enhancing lesion. What other condition can cause ring enhancing lesions in the brain in someone with a CD4 count below 200? Toxo, I know everyone's like toxo, toxo, toxo. So I, there are gonna be situations where the question is gonna expect you to differentiate between primary CNS lymphoma and toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis tends to be more widespread, more multifocal, right? So there tends to be multiple ring enhancing lesions. If you see one big one, think more CNS lymphoma. CNS lymphoma can be multiple, but again, that's sort of the distinction that I've seen in my mind be most helpful from an imaging standpoint, distinguish those two on tests. <clears throat> I wanted to throw this slide in here, um, basically because I want to talk about uh, effects of longstanding alcohol use on the brain, um, Wernicke's encephalopathy versus Korsakoff syndrome is super commonly tested right on step one, as well as the psych sh shelf, the neuro shelf, step two medicine. I mean, it's everywhere. So a thiamine deficiency with injury to the mammillary bodies, almost often in the setting of alcohol use as the triad of encephalopathy, ophthalmoplegia, so, so eye movement abnormalities and ataxia. Right? So it, again, ataxia is sort of, uh, uncoordinated movements when targeting an object. It's typically reversible. You treat it with IV thymine. This has a biochemistry correlate. Someone comes in, they, the test is often unkind and, and gives you some stigma of people who um, have alcohol use disorder. They tell you that this person is disheveled. This person smells like alcohol. They have a blood glucose of 55 and they wanna know what should you do? They have, you think they have Wernicke's encephalopathy, but they have dangerous hypoglycemia. And you suspect that they have Wernicke's. So I have give thiamine before sugar. Yeah, I give thiamine first, right? So remember that thiamine is a cofactor in the citric acid cycle. So I give someone a ton of sugar, it's gonna run through the citric acid cycle. It's gonna get to that spot where it needs thiamine as a cofactor. Thiamine's not gonna be there. It's gonna worsen the thiamine deficiency. So you give thiamine first, then it, all that sugar can run through the citric acid cycle, no problem. Awesome. Korsakoff syndrome, I typically view it as the later end of the spectrum of Wernicke's. It's viewed as more permanent damage, irreversible, and sort of the clinical feature is confabulation. The hard part is picking out when they're, they're describing this. What they'll do is they'll give you the patient telling a story and then a very clear, like that that's not the case, right? So a patient will come in with cuts and bruises and they'll say, oh, how'd you get those? Oh, I was on a ride at the circus and I fell off. 
and they'll be like, well, there was no circus. And like, they'll give you something. These patients are not intentionally lying. The mammalian bodies are part of that sort of internal memory thing that we talked about at the very beginning of tonight. And can the confabulation is sort of inventing memories because the ability to access them is not there. It's the best way I can describe it. So they're not intentionally lying, but they're making things up to replace memories that aren't there. Um, okay, the last thing, I, I always see people kind of miss this because we get so focused on alcohol use leading to Wernicke's and Korsakoff's that we don't think about what else alcohol does to the brain. Alcohol is a cerebellar toxin. Um, if you think about bedside tests for DUI, they tend to be things like walking with tandem gait, right? Walking with one foot in the other, which is a test of cerebellar function, as well as watching someone's eyes kind of move in a coordinated fashion across the target. Your cerebellum helps do that kind of smooth pursuit. If it's not working, the eyes will sort of click along, right? So if you ever see someone who's had a little too much to drink, their eyes will sort of click if you have them follow your finger rather than sort of smooth following. Long-standing alcohol use can damage the vermis, so the middle of the cerebellum, and that can manifest with a gait disorder, right? So, think, so they can have a wide-based gait, as well as nystagmus, right? But typically, you're going to see it on imaging. That's what they're going to tell you, that there's sort of atrophy of the vermis of the cerebellum. This text at the bottom jumped all the way down. This is for my, my OB shelf people, my future OBGYNs. What condition can also cause Wernicke's encephalopathy? Anorexia good. Can. There's one I think maybe is a little more common. So first trimester patient who's having just a really rough go of it. Just every morning just vomiting uncontrollably. Yeah, HG, so hyperemesis gravidarum can sometimes cause Wernicke's encephalopathy. I've seen it very, very few questions, but it's there. Um, not something you're gonna be tested on. Good to know though, maybe you'd be tested. Um, we, this is the subtitle of this section was sort of consequences of some substance use. Uh, cocaine and methamphetamine can cause stroke, right? So those are vasoactive cocaine, um, vasoconstricts can cause stroke, same with methamphetamine. Substances that can cause seizure, right? Cocaine and methamphetamine again, alcohol and withdrawal, benzodiazepines and withdrawal. And then I, I put this in here. There's technically substances that we put into people's bodies, but certain antibiotics. Those are, it's, again, it's more first step two type things, but the other ones are, are nice too. Two imaging differential diagnoses, just to sort of show you that maybe some things can sound very similar and, and have some differences to them. Great. I have two different CT scans here, right? The bone is very bright and the resolution is not great. So this is a CT scan. And all I'm telling you in the vignette is this is a 70 year old female who has forgetfulness, incontinence and ataxia. What's sort of one of the diagnoses that jumps to mind with that? NPH, great. So left or right, NPH. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll do, let me annotate these. And this will be my left, this will be my right. Ventricles are about the same size in both. They're pretty big. Yeah, Harmon says the left. What do we think the right is? Harmon says the right is Alzheimer's. So I, I agree, I might not say Alzheimer's in specific, particular, but. So this is normal pressure hydrocephalus on the left, right? And so this over here is hydrocephalus ex vacuo, right? And so this is sort of the word we use for when there's so much volume loss to the brain that the ventricles look huge. If you look over here, the ventricles are big, but the brain kind of reaches out to the edge, right? The sulci and gyri are pretty normal versus here, right? We've got it kind of moving away from the edge. These are pretty deep. There's lots of... CSF showing throughout. So these ventricles look big because the brain around them has shrunk. These ventricles are big because there's too much fluid and they're causing pressure pushing things out. Does that make sense? So left, normal pressure hydrocephalus, right, hydrocephalus like vacuo. I, anyone with dementia can have forgetfulness, they can have incontinence, 
And then ataxia is sort of nonspecific, right? You can have difficulty with movements for a lot of reasons. So you should think neuro NPH with that sort of, but I want you to know that it could be something else. And this is a good imaging differential. Okay, this side's a little busier. I have a normal T2 MRI in the middle. And then I have one on the left and one on the right that are different disorders, um, both of which we've talked about today. So this is a 50 year old gentleman who has a personality change and a positive family history of someone with something similar. So Auburn says frontal temporal dementia, Kevin says FTD, so I agree. And which one is that? Same convention left or right? Yeah, so this is FTD on the left, right? So we have sort of focal, right? Again, if I drew this line here, the brain back here is very full, the brain up here is very empty. And now the one on the right is a little harder. So I want you to kind of ignore altogether the side on the left, right? So let's, can I do this? Yeah, let's get rid of it. So now comparing this normal MRI in the middle to the one on the right, and I'm giving you the vignette of someone who has personality changes. Is there anything you notice that's abnormal on the right side? It's always harder when we can't chat, but. And I might just pretend, temporal lobes like normal, temporal lobes increase signal. Okay, yeah, okay, okay I hear you. Um, might be just the way that imaging is different. So I want you to look at the ventricles here. This is not the perfect image of this versus the ventricles here. So we have bigger ventricles, yeah, on this side. And it's kind of weird that it's just this, this one spot. Like, yes, these are slightly bigger than this, but they're about the same shape. I also want to point out this structure here that I said is always, that's like basically gone here. These are at a little different levels so that can affect it, but yeah, so the Huntington's, awesome, Erica. So in Huntington's, we destroy the caudate. And what happens when I get rid of the caudate is this ventricle tends to fill that space and looks selectively bigger. So this kind of appearance on the right, again, this is not a perfect image, but of these ventricles being way bigger than anything else and really nothing else being wrong, should make you think about Huntington's, especially with the clinical vignette of personality changes and the family history of the same. A little mean, right? Obviously not something that would be a question, never something you should diagnose without the vignette. Um, my kind of take on imaging for a lot of these tests is that it's gonna be about 20% of the questions and only about 20% of those do you absolutely have to use it. Sometimes you can get around it with just like really good understanding of the subject matter. All right, that last one was hard. Okay, so before we get to a Q&A, hopefully that was helpful. Um, left pick, so this was frontotemporal dementia. Yeah, so i talk a little bit about what we do um, at Med School Tutors. Um, Right, we do things like this, which is super fun for me and hopefully really helpful for you. We also do one-on-one -on -one tutoring, right? So I work with students kind of one-on-one, -on -one, um, really customize what a study schedule looks like for them and makes sense for them. Um, go through questions, kind of through basic like source questions together, short lectures like this on topics, draw things out sort of like we did with basal ganglia and other confusing things. Um, and just really help navigate what's, what's an unfortunate aspect of really of, of medical training is having to take all these tests. Um, the headquarters is putting in the chat, I'd love to hear feedback about how I can be better and be more helpful for you um, in the future. Uh, and just going through some of the other things, right? So, so one-time planning sessions for just, hey, I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed on what to do going from there. Um, I will take questions about like, anything that has to do with neurology preferably stuff we talked about tonight. What about some, some worms? Worms causing dementia. I don't have a great one for you there. It could. Um, I mean, there's like the really horrible, what is it, the Nigleria phalari, like the freshwater thing that gets in through your nose and just causes rapid death. 
I, do, I don't tend to think about that in my like dementia workup. If I'm trying to really stretch here and go for a step one correlate, um, the diphilobothrum latum tapeworm can cause a B12 deficiency, but having that be the answer choice for a dementia question would be a little absurd. But yes, technically that worm can cause B12, which could cause a dementia type picture. Uh, Alina, difference between schizophrenia, schizotypal. Okay, so a little bit of psychiatry, but yeah, so typically, so all of the psych syndromes, um, more so than anything within neuro, you need to memorize the timeline for criteria. Um, schizophrenia, right, requires six months of symptoms. Schizotypal, sort of being a personality disorder, does not have, they, they have no uh, dis impairment of their daily life, right? So we talk about dementia versus normal memory problems. You have to impair someone's life. Schizotypal as a personality disorder does not cause impairment. But yes, I hear you, it's hard, right? So brief psychotic disorder to one month, schizophreniform one month to six months, schizophrenia six months out, and you have schizotypal and schizoid. But those are personality disorders, no impairment. Great. Okay, I think the questions have slowed down and before I uh, move too far into psychiatry and embarrass myself, I, uh, We'll go ahead and wrap up and thank you so much all for being here and for participating and for um, just hearing me talk about one of my favorite things. So, all right, please give us feedback and I hope you all have a good rest of your night.